In this video, we will explore photoreceptors, rod and cone cells, their structure, and how they work. This is a photo of the retina inside the eye, a layer of nerve tissue that acts like film in a camera. It is made up of several types of cells, the most important of which is the photoreceptor, with its ability to sense light and turn that into nerve impulses. The remaining cells organize and transmit those nerve impulses to the brain. My thesis statement is that the photoreceptor is the single most complicated and amazing cell in the body. There is nothing like it. This is a companion to the previous two videos in which we covered phototransduction, the mechanism how of how light is registered within the photoreceptor cell, and the visual cycle, how the photosensitive retinal is recycled. In investigating how the photoreceptor works, we are going to delve into some important and really interesting cell biology. We have looked at the structure of the eye in detail in other videos. In general, when light enters the eye, it is focused by the cornea and lens to form an image on the retina. Individual photons are absorbed by photoreceptor cells which change the level of their electrical activity, thereby signaling arrival of photons. Here in the retina, somewhat surprisingly, the photoreceptors are the outer layer, meaning light has to travel through the inner layers made of other nerve cells to reach the outer light sensing cells. The chain of information goes like this. When a photoreceptor senses light, it engages bipolar and other intermediate cells which in turn stimulate a ganglion cell, which then carries information along an axon on the inner surface of the retina to the optic nerve head and back to the brain. Actually, the circuitry is more complicated than that, but those are details for another day. The photoreceptor. There are in general five distinct parts of a photoreceptor cell, here using a rod cell as an example. The outer segment, the connecting cilium, the inner segment, the nucleus, and the synapse. Or functionally, it divides up into these regions. The outer segment contains many pancake-like discs, which is where the photosensing rhodopsin and the rest of the phototransduction cascade is located. There are typically a thousand discs in each rod outer segment. The outer segment is connected to the inner segment by the connecting cilium, an important gateway between the two. In part of the inner segment, densely packed mitochondria produce the large amount of energy needed by this very active cell. In another part, the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus produce rhodopsin and other important molecules needed for function. Consider this question. The outer segment has no ability to synthesize the many molecules it needs to function. How do those molecules get from the inner segment where they are produced to the outer segment where they are used? That is a big subject and we will get to it soon. The nucleus is where the DNA blueprints are kept and transcribed into mRNA. The synapse is where the photoreceptor, which is a sensory neuron, connects to other nerve cells in the chain we mentioned. While rods and cones share the same main function, sensing light, they have some significant differences. In common, both cells use retinal as the primary light sensing molecule. The difference in wavelength sensitivity is based on slight differences in the structure of the opsin molecule holding the retinal. Cones are concentrated within the very center of the retina, while rods dominate outside the center. Rod cells work only in low light conditions, giving grayscale vision. They are so sensitive, they are capable of sensing a single photon arrival. Amazing. Structurally, rod disks are enclosed completely within the plasma membrane of the outer segment. Cones work in bright light and serve color vision. Structurally, the cone disks are open to the extracellular space. If you want to be more anatomically correct, this is what rod and cone cells look like. I have traced these shapes from an electron micrograph. 
Note the rod synapse is a smaller spherule, while the cone synapse is a relatively larger pedicle. Flipping them over orients them as we will look at them in the retina. This diagram and microscope view shows where the main types of retinal cells are located and how they connect to one another. Any time we are talking about photoreceptors, it's important not to overlook the supporting cast, the retinal pigment epithelial cells, RPE for short. You can see the heads of the rods and cones are nestled in the microvilli that extend from the surface of the RPE cells. This diagram is not drawn to scale. In the fovea, each RPE cell is engaged with over 20 photoreceptors. Here is a general outline of what they do. 1. Metabolic support. RPE cells control the transport of different important ions and nutrients like sodium, potassium, glucose, and vitamin A from the bloodstream. 2. Recycling of the key photosensitive chemical retinal from the inactive all trans form to the active 11 cis form. This process is called the visual cycle. 3. Digestion of rod and cone outer segment pieces as they are shed on a daily basis. 4. RPE cells secrete several important growth factors such as PEDF and VEGF. 5. The pigment in the RPE cell serves to absorb extra light so it doesn't bounce around inside the eye. I am pointing out just how important the RPE is for retinal function. Put another way, when things go wrong with RPE cells, that is a major cause of retinal disease. This is a good review article if you wish to read further about RPE function. Now that we have made a general acquaintance with the photoreceptor, let's look at each part in more detail. The first thing to know is that the outer segment of a photoreceptor is a modified cilium. What is a cilium? It is a projection from the surface of a cell that serves a specialized function related to either motion or sensation. It turns out that most mammalian cells have some kind of cilia structure. Some cilia can move, like in the bronchial tract, several moving in concert to sweep mucus and debris from the lining of the respiratory passageways, or like flagella for, for propelling a cell. Other cilia do not move, rather they are sensory. Think of the cilia as an antenna, protruding from the cell into the surrounding environment. In kidney cells, they serve an important function in sensing the direction of urine flow or important for us in photoreceptors. This diagram shows a regular non-motile cilium. It has a central shaft containing a ring of microtubules in this specific arrangement. In non-motile cilia, peripheral microtubules are organized in nine doublets or singlets. In motile cilia, there is a central microtubule doublet. The structural core of microtubules is called the axoneme. In the photoreceptor, in this outer compartment, the outer segment, we also add the discs. More specifically, in the photoreceptor, the base of the axoneme, the basal body, is located in the top of the inner segment. The axoneme structure extends through the connecting cilium into the outer segment. This diagram shows how cilia in general, and the outer segment in particular, is thought to develop. Cells have an orientation. They know which way is up. Inside the top, or apical part of the developing photoreceptor cell, a mother centriole joins to a ciliary vesicle. The centriole is the origin and anchor of the microtubules that make up the mitotic spindle. That is responsible for chromosome separation at cell division. After the cell is finished dividing, the centriole migrates to a new position ready to start forming the axoneme. This is now termed the basal body and microtubules begin to extend from it. Soon the vacuole fuses with the cell membrane and the cilium continues to grow, becoming the outer segment. Thus the finished product, 
with the basal body as the anchor for the axoneme, the backbone of the outer segment. When the cilia do not function correctly, that leads to a category of disease called ciliopathies, with some examples shown here. The defining feature of the outer segment is the discs that fill it. The discs contain the phototransduction apparatus that senses and responds to light, the reason for its existence. This diagram shows most of the main molecules important for a disc slash photoreceptor function. For phototransduction to work correctly, all these need to be here and in this configuration. Looking closer at the discs, they are remarkably uniform in shape and thickness. Their dimensions are shown here. They are also remarkably uniform in their spacing from one another within the outer segment. To get a better idea of their shape, this is a tracing of discs from an electron micrograph. Within each disc, different molecules have specific locations. For example, rhodopsin and the molecules of phototransduction are located in the center part of the disc, while others are located at the edges. Rhodopsin molecules occupy half the volume of each disc. Mice that have the rhodopsin gene removed produce thin, disorganized outer segments. Peripherin and ROM1 are important molecules that join in a complex that is required to form the rounded edge of the disc. CNG channels, though they are not located in the disc, it is important to know they are located in the plasma membrane. The peripherin ROM complex of the disc rim is connected to the CNG channel in the plasma membrane by another molecule, a glutamic acid-rich protein, or GARP. That connection establishes the spacing between the disc edge and the plasma membrane. Looking at the stack of discs in the outer segment, you might ask, what is happening with those discs? How did they get there? Are they static? Do they change? Way back in the 1960s, a researcher named Richard Young did an historic experiment. He injected a radio-labeled amino acid, uh, H3-methionine, which highlighted pr protein production, most of which would be as rhodopsin. The label showed up as expected, first in the endoplasmic reticulum, then traversed the Golgi apparatus to accumulate in the connecting cilium and at the bottom of the disc stack. Over time, the band of radio-labeled protein could be seen ascending to the top of the stack. And then what? The discs at the top of the stack were pinched off and digested by the RPE cells. It was an elegant demonstration of the life cycle of a rod disc in the outer segment, showing that the discs are constantly added at the bottom of the stack and shed at the top. In a typical day, about 10% of the disc stack, about 100 discs, is shed at the top and replaced at the bottom. Put another way, the entire disc stack is replaced about every 10 days. That is a lot of synthetic activity each and every day. The same process occurs in cone cells, but could not be observed by this radio labeling technique because molecules have more freedom to diffuse throughout the cone cells. This is nicely covered by the man who made that history, Richard Young, in the Friedenwald Lecture of 1976. Regarding the discs that reach the top of the stack, here they are shown as they are shed from the photoreceptor tip and digested by the RPE cell. Remember we showed the tip of the RPE cell with microvilli that surround the tips of the photoreceptor cells. Now consider what must happen to make this process work. Something in the cell surface must act as a signal to the RPE cell, declaring that this piece of outer segment is different and ready to be digested known as the, quote, eat me signal. The discs are not pushed into the RPE cell. The RPE cell has to develop extensions to surround the tip of the outer segment. This means the RPE cell has to stimulate its cytoskeleton to create pseudopods to engulf the outer segment. 
Once the RPE cell has engulfed a chunk of outer segment, it must then digest the proteins and lipids contained in that piece. Also, also remember that the RPE cells are post-mitotic, meaning these cells do not divide anymore. No replacements are coming. These are the cells you have for your lifetime. In other words, the RPE cells are committed to digesting a lifetime of cellular material. They must be very efficient at this so as to minimize buildup of waste products. However, waste products do build up over time, and that is one of the mechanisms of RPE cell damage. The details of the disk disposal process are nicely reviewed in this paper. While the disks are being shed and digested at one end of the photoreceptor, they are created in an equal amount at the base of the disk stack. For many years, it was not clear how disks were formed. One model suggested that at the base of the outer segment, a piece of cell membrane began a protrusion that turned into a disk. The outward extension is called an evagination. In a short distance, it separated itself from the plasma membrane, forming an internal disk. Diagrams of this have always looked to me like an M.C. Escher drawing. An alternative model was based on electron micrographs that showed what, happened, what appeared to be rounded vesicles, which could be joining together internally to form a disk. This debate has been going on for a long time and looks to have been settled by a recent piece of research coming down on the side of the evagination model. All those molecules we saw in the disk, where did they come from? That journey begins within the nucleus, which is, of course, where the DNA is housed. In the simplified model, it is in the nucleus that DNA transcription occurs into an RNA messenger. After the RNA leaves the nucleus, ribosomes attach to the mRNA and translate that sequence of base pairs into a string of amino acids, otherwise known as a protein. That is a reasonable understanding of the basic biology, but there's more. This simple scheme only occurs in prokaryotic cells, those without a nucleus, like bacteria. For eukaryotic cells, those with a nucleus, the process is a step more complicated, and this turns out to be a very important step. In eukaryotic cells, like ours, within the nucleus, the DNA is transcribed to pre-mRNA. The pre-mRNA then undergoes a processing step before leaving the nucleus. That processing step is carried out by something called the spliceosome, possibly the single most complicated piece of biology in the cell. The spliceosome is important to mention for two reasons. One is that it allows the eukaryotic cell to combine a small number of gene segments called exons into multiple combinations allowing for a diversity of finished proteins from a smaller number of basic building blocks. The second reason is that an estimated 20% of all genetic disorders relate to defects in spliceosome function. For retinitis pigmentosa, those defects are the second most common cause of autosomal dominant RP, second only to muta mutations in rhodopsin. From the genetic mechanisms of the nucleus, let us move on to protein synthesis. Consider that the outer segment has no ribosomes. That means no machinery for producing proteins, like rhodopsin, or any of the other molecules it needs to function. The inner segment is the factory that produces those molecules. It contains two main regions. This is a sketch from an electron micrograph showing a more magnified view of roughly what the inner segment looks like. The connecting cilium is not shown in this view. Adjacent to the outer segment is the ellipsoid region, so named because of the heavy concentration of mitochondria here. One theory suggests the highly active mitochondria are closest to the oxygen source of the choroid. Between the ellipsoid region and the nucleus is the myoid region. This diagram view shows the myoid region contains the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus, in which the mRNA directs protein assembly. Additional packaging occurs in the Golgi apparatus. Let us return to rhodopsin as an example, because it is so important. How much rhodopsin are we talking about? First, researchers calculate that in a mouse rod outer segment, there are approximately 6 times 10 to the 7th 
rhodopsin molecules. Second, the outer segment discs are completely replaced every 10 days, meaning 10% are replaced daily. If you do the math, that means within each rod cell, 80 rhodopsin molecules have to be synthesized and transported to the outer segment every second, 4800 every minute, and so on. Rate of replacement varies related to light and time of day, but we will not cover that aspect here. Consider how busy the machinery must be producing and transporting that rhodopsin. In addition to constantly producing a large quantity of rhodopsin molecules, the inner segment must also produce a large number of other important molecules. But you can't have all that rhodopsin, or the other molecules for that matter, diffusing randomly around within the cell, going to places they would not be utilized. How are all those molecules going to get to their final location in the outer segment? It turns out there is a transport system within the cell that picks up molecular packages in one location and carries them to another. Protein trafficking, or intracellular UPS. Because this is so important, there is a lot of coverage of this subject in the biology literature. Here is a basic outline. The basal body we mentioned before is the anchor for the transport system. In one direction is a set of microtubules extending toward the cell nucleus, called rootlets. Extending in the other direction, into the outer segment, is the axoneme, also made of microtubules. You also need to know that microtubules have a directional orientation, usually indicated by convention, noting which is the plus end. In general, the plus end is directed toward the periphery of the cell, and its direction is called anterograde. This is a simplified version of the transport motor mechanism. There is a head region attached to a microtubule. There is a tail region holding onto the cargo package with a stalk connecting the two. The motor head uses ATP hydrolysis to generate step-like movements along the microtubule. Here I am showing the motors, their cargo, and the microtubules on a smaller scale. For our purpose, we will mention two types of motors. One class called Kinesin motors move toward the plus end of microtubules. The other class, Dynein motors, move in the opposite direction, away from the plus end. This method of transportation is called intraflagellar transport, IFT for short intracellular UPS. A minute ago, we noted that rhodopsin is synthesized by the endoplasmic reticulum. In the Golgi and trans-Golgi network, it is packaged into vesicles destined for the outer segment. That packaging and targeting process are summarized in this very busy illustration. In general, processing requires several parts based on small GTPases their effectors and activators. The RAB family acts as a widespread controller of membrane interactions, vesicle budding in one location and vesicle fusion in another. That means controlling vesicle movement from Golgi to plasma membrane. Also early on, rhodopsin has two targeting labels, one located at the C-terminal end. The last four amino acids have the sequence VXPX, meaning valine, any amino acid, proline, and any amino acid. A second label is an FR motif within one of the helices. Details of this process can be found in this article. Or here is a nice review from a medical perspective. Before we sign off, once normal the function is half the story. Are formed, there Something are also two videos on retinitis pigmentosa, and this is where our retinal dystrophy caused by degeneration of the rod cells in the retina. There are more intermediate. The steps. interesting thing For here example, is that it has such a diverse complex. range of causes, it has to do with each related to defects the in the many processes the the we just talked resilient. about in the normal rod cell. We mentioned that specifically. One here video is on the clinical aspects. In the what effects the disease system, has on vision and how it progresses. Syndrome involving the other is on the biology behind it, with which again connects to all the physiology we have talked about more. in this set of videos. Finally, we come the to credits. The in this case, the references the are selected for two reasons. 
One is they are good reviews, cells. and two that is because they the represent major authors in the field. Could this be a simple thing where each photoreceptor connects to one bipolar cell? No, of course not. Each photoreceptor con cell connects to multiple other cells. As we mentioned in the beginning, this is the typical cell appearance. Note the synapses at the bottom. Looking much more closely, cone synapses, called pedicles, tend to be large and relatively flat and connect to many other cells. Rod synapses, called spherules, tend to be smaller and round and connect to a few other cells. Specifically, the yellow bulbs represent the ends of horizontal cell axons invaginating into the synapse. The blue bulbs represent the end of an on bipolar cell. This grouping typically occurs as this trio arrangement called a triad. The green bulbs represent the ends of off bipolar cells. The photoreceptor synapse has one more special feature worth noting, a ribbon structure with many attached vesicles containing the neurotransmitter glutamate. This arrangement allows for a release of neurotransmitter capable of varying from small to large volumes, which allows for rapid, graded, and sustained responses instead of the classical single action potentials. This is unique too and particularly appropriate for responses used in visual signaling. Calcium level is the key controller of glutamate release, which is discussed in the video on phototransduction. There is so much going on here. In a future video, we will tackle the complicated wiring of the retina. Before we finish, to show how connected biology is, we will briefly show the motors in the RPE cell. The kinesin motor that we saw before is carrying its cargo, a phagosome, along a microtubule toward the plus end. The dynein motor is also carrying its cargo along microtubules, but toward the minus end in this example carrying a melanosome and vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum. But the diagram shows another structural component in red made of actin filaments. These are present in the villi of the RPE cell. There is another motor that travels this highway derived from myosin, in this case MYO7A. A ways back we covered shedding and digestion of the outer tips of the photoreceptors. Within the apical processes of the RPE cell, there is a scaffold of actin filaments scaled by myo7 motors, which transport melanosomes, phagosomes, and vesicles to the cell body, where the dynein and kinesin motors take over. In summary, we have seen a lot of complex and interesting biology going on inside the photoreceptor cell. While rod and cone cells have significant differences, for example, low light and grayscale versus bright light and color, sensitivity, response time, retinal location, and more, they do share most of their physiology in common. Starting with the outer segment, this is where the machinery for phototransduction is located. More specifically, it is located in the discs of the outer segment, a thousand discs in the typical rod cell. In the companion videos, we covered phototransduction the mechanism for sensing light and signaling that by way of a change in cell voltage. We also covered the visual cycle, recycling of retinal in the RPE. Developmentally, the outer segment is a modified cilium. That is a feature these cells share in common with most other mammalian cells. Creation of new discs occurs at the base of the outer segment. Each photoreceptor sheds about 100 discs per day. Therefore, it must replace those 100 discs each and every day. There now seems good evidence that the discs are formed at the base of the outer segment by the process of evagination. When the discs reach the top of the outer segment, they are engulfed and digested by the RPE cells. Looking more closely at the disc, there are multiple important proteins in the disc and their location is specific and important. Rhodopsin occupies the center of the disc, while peripherin and ROM1 join in a complex that is required to form the rounded edge of the disc. The peripherin-ROM complex also forms a connection with the CNG channels 
which helps maintain the very regular disk position and spacing. But the other segment has no ribosomes. That means no means of producing those molecules. Their production starts in the nucleus with transcription from DNA to pre-mRNA and spliceosome editing for mature mRNA. Translation occurs via ribosomes in the endoplasmic reticulum. Further protein modifications occur through the Golgi apparatus to label the proteins they are targeted for their appropriate final destination. Those address labels attached to the proteins, like rhodopsin, tell the intracellular transport machinery where to carry them. They can't just wander randomly around the cell. How much production are we talking about? Knowing the rate of disk turnover, we can make a calculation of the number of molecules of rhodopsin produced per second. It is not a small number. At the end of the photoreceptor is the synapse, which communicates to other cells in the retina but not just one intermediate cell, but a variety of cell types. Nothing is simple in the retina. Lastly, don't forget the RPE cells. They serve many important functions in supporting the photoreceptors. Before we sign off, normal function is half the story. There are also two videos on retinitis pigmentosa, a retinal dystrophy caused by degeneration of the rod cells in the retina. The interesting thing here is that it has such a diverse range of causes, each related to defects of the many processes we just talked about in the normal rod cell. One video is on the clinical aspects, what effects the disease has on vision and how it progresses. The other is on the biology behind it, which again connects to all the physiology we have talked about in this set of videos. The credits, in this case the references, are selected for two reasons. One is they are good reviews, and two is because they represent major authors in the field.